Hello everybody and welcome to another weekly update. Um, my name is Martin. I'm an Inkscape developer developing features and fixes for everyday Inkscape users. Welcome to another week where I tell you about some of the things that I've gotten up to uh, trying to make Inkscape better. And also some of the things that have ha happened in Inkscape that I didn't do. Um, first of all, as always, I want to give a big thank you to all of the people that sponsor me. Um, it's really through your contributions that allows me to spend time on Inkscape. And without that, I simply wouldn't be able to have the time. I'd have to spend it on other contracts. Um, so th thank you all so much, especially the new pe people who, who have joined. Uh, making that commi commitment is really, really appreciated. Um, okay, so let's get into what I've been up to. Um, this is actually going to be about two weeks worth of work, but... Eh. Um, there was a blend mode change. This is a small change that, that I added, which is uh, Dan Hollock posted a design for reordering the blend modes, and he made a pretty convincing uh, argument why the blend mode should be in a different order. Um, so I basically followed that design, implemented it in Inkscape in both the fill and stroke dialog and in the new layers, objects and layers uh, blend modes right click which doesn't exist in 1.2 1, 1 but hopefully I can show you uh, it was added by my cover a few weeks ago the reordering though um, should help people find the correct blend, blend mode and understand a bit better which blend, blend mode will actually do something use, use, useful for you um, the bulk of my work has been focusing on PDF uh, so I'm doing currently PDF input um, this is because the PDF input is a fixable problem, um, unlike PDF output, which is a bit of a bit more of a mess. Uh, mostly to do with educating myself on how PDF works, what tools are available, etc. Um, one of the pro problems that the, our PDF input has in Inkscape is that it ignores fonts. Now, it tries to substitute fonts. Okay, so here's the thing about PDF. PDF contains the fonts used in the PDF itself. So if you wanted to just render the PDF as a graphic, you can do that by using the fonts that are stored inside the file. But if you wanted to have editable text, you now have to interpret what font was used and correctly guess things like the size and the spacing and all of the other attributes. Inkscapes uh, tries to do some of this, but you'll probably no notice that if you try to use the internal importer in Inkscape, often the fonts are wrong um, and the text does not appear in the correct places, even though the glyphs are positioned in the places in the P P PDF file that you know the PDF file says. Um, they're not the right size or they're not the right style, so they don't look right. Uh, so partially this is a problem with the um, font substitution. So this is where if it can't find the font uh, that's labeled in, in, in the PDF, it'll attempt to find one on your system. Um, there are a bunch of problems. You don't know whether you have a font installed. You don't know what font is going to be used in that PDF file. And here's the thing. The font file doesn't have to tell the truth about what the font is called. More on that in a minute. So the first thing that I wanted to do was um, make it visible what fonts are, are being requested in a PDF when you open it and what fonts are going to be substituted. To attack this problem, I wanted to change the user interface for the PDF import. Um, basically a refresh of the design. Now there are two tabs, one for Cairo import. Uh, Cairo is what some people call Poplar, but both, they're both using Poplar, so that's not a great name. So the Cairo Im import is what is just drawing everything and the, you can't edit any of the text. And there are no other options too, like multi-page, because we don't control any of that. It's an external process. The in, internal import, on the other hand, that's where we get to have all, all of our control. So these are now two tabs. And uh, what I've done is I've created a drop-down of what strategy we should use for text when the font isn't available. So you'll see there's a little bit of a drop drop down there. You can render them out to glyphs, which is very much like what the Cairo importer will do, but only for fonts that we don't know. Um, we could substitute the font, or we can just leave the font fam from family name as to whatever the PDF said it was. Uh, this is just in case you want to uh, open the SVG later and the font family name is actually correct, although that's probably unlikely. 
So let's get into the actual font naming problem. So um, I added a list that allows you to see all of the fonts that are labeled in the um, uh, PDF. And also it will make them italic if they're in, if the fonts are actually in that page that's being pre previewed. Um, I improved the pre preview as well. Um, the list though caused me some consternation because I could create a PDF file on my computer using Inkscape and then I'd try and reopen that PDF file with Inkscape and Inkscape would say, oh, none of these fonts are here. And you're like, wait a minute, I just create, created this. Clearly the fonts are here. And what was happening was is that the, the font names inside the PDF file weren't parsable. Inkscape wasn't doing a very good job of parsing these font names. And so it, it had to guess what fonts. And often what this would mean is like bolds and italics would disappear entirely. Uh, fonts would be substituted with the nearest, closest things. But like even if the font was available, it wouldn't use the right one. So I think making this font list is actually important for a developer like myself because I can see immediately that the font substitution that we have, have been relying on for years and years to, to open these PDF files is just inadequate. Like it's it's basically broken. Um, so what I did is I put a bunch of work into trying to fix that problem by better matching the fonts. Um, it's not perfect though, because a lot of the fonts are lies. The, the PDF file doesn't exactly tell us the font family name. So trying to match them to the fonts you have installed and be confident that the font is the same font is tricky. And so it's going to be a bit of um, test and see. We're going to we're going to have a bunch of PDF files with a bunch of different fonts in them. See what kind of font names the PDF file says it is, and then we're going to try and match them to fonts that are installed. Um, I suspect that even if I had every single Google font installed, there would still be a bunch of PDFs that wouldn't op open correctly. Um, so there's also some other stuff that I'm I am planning to do for P PDF. Uh, I need to do that re renderer. Uh, that's available in the drop drop down so far the drop drop down doesn't do anything and I need to either give you an option or just remove the glyph positioning because I think glyph positioning in PDF opening is actually problematic and if uh, the if we have the right font then we shouldn't really need to position each of the glyphs uh, either that or I could actually fix the font editor if the glyphs are positioned but that's just a technical thing whatever the user experience is best uh, that's the thing we should do. Okay, enough P PDF stuff. Let's get into the features and fixes from the rest of the Inkscape community. These are things that I didn't do. Um, James, first of all, intern James uh, fixed a lock all guides button. So user experience problem where the button wasn't synced up. Uh, Rene fixed the spell check checker in the Mac OX release. Uh, thanks, Rene. Uh, James Holder actually fixed a an SVG2 web browser problem where they would miss the Xlink namespace from hrefs. This is where you have an anchor tag or some kind of reference. And Xlink has been deprecated. It's still in SVG 1.1 though. Uh, <laughs> Habir uh, fixed a bunch of things. He fixed this a silent un undo in style pa pasting, uh, two tooltips in the men menus, and some L LP fixes. Um, there's some new fa faces here. So Matt Jakeman added a dark document properties to the right click menu. If there's no object on, on, under the under the cursor, it's a nice little quick way to get to the document. A bit like a desktop would go to the document uh, desktop properties. Uh, Noah Pezant fixed a behavior in re re relinking clones. Nice work. Uh, Nathan Lee fixed the a, a marker fault fallback issue and a herline stroke on groups when you're pa pasting in place. Um, PBS fixed a palette loading issue. He says that it's a minor fix, but I like to include it anyway. Um, and also a fix for selective dithering. Um, this is a note about selective dithering. If you have been having problems on Windows with speed, turning off dithering is probably going to save you a lot of tr trouble. I believe dithering is only enabled on win Windows for 1.2, 1, 1 and I don't think it's worked out well. So uh, yeah, definitely try that. Okay, uh, that's about it for this week. Uh, thank you for jo joining me. I'm going to be spending the day uh, celebrating 
because it's my birth, birth birthday. But I wanted to get this video out for you. And um, hopefully I will see you all next week. Please do subscribe, share these vi vi videos. Um, join me on Mastodon if you can. That's where I post a lot of stuff. And I'll see you all next week.